This is the Spacebook channel. I'm Dan Hadley, and yeah, this is another Type Over 40 video. Well, I say another, I haven't made any all year. <laughs> but yeah, we're back, and in case you didn't know the general gist of it, this is a before show, an after show, and an in-between show to the Type 40 podcast that I host and produce and put out on social media for the Fandom Podcast Network. Been doing it for a couple of years now, and I think we've just we've just spiked. This is Rosie. <laughs> this is Rosie, the house Dalek, here to keep me company and uh, watch my toxic masculinity, as I'm always telling people. Yeah, because when I haven't got playmates in, somebody's got to keep an eye on me. Yeah, this is the first one I've made on my own for a little while, so I'm a little bit rusty, maybe. Usually, I've got a starry-eyed girl in. Hello, Sarah. Or oh, Simon Horton. We have to think of a name for Simon Horton, won't we? The original Hunatic, I think we'll call Simon. Or there's Adam O'Brien, the lethal mullet. Yeah, they're all good enough. They pop in from time to time, but for now, it's just me. I've had a lot of messages from people, various call outs and shout outs and tags or whatever to make more videos please Dan. So yeah, that's the idea. And here I am, I've rushed to the camera at last. Let's get started in a big, big week for Doctor Who. I'm not going to lie to you, everybody. I've really struggled with this. I really have. And you know, you've seen me, haven't you, Rosie? It's not been, not been a pretty sight. And the main reason, <laughs> the main reason is, of course, I'm a nasty old gatekeeping sexist. Ma no. <laughs> the real reason is genuine, genuine shock and not knowing how to take it all in. Uh, yeah, we're a few days after the launch, the premiere of Fugitive of the Jadoon. Now, normally, at this point in the week, myself, Simon, Starry, and whoever else I've managed to get in, you know, we, we've recorded the podcast by now about whatever episode's just been on. I needed 24, 48, and then 72 hours before I could begin to talk about it for a number of reasons. Some good, but yeah, lots, lots pretty bad get to that in a moment uh, yeah nice things first what the postman brought me very happy with this the old season 26 set this is the uh it's the fifth one for me but the sixth one in general you know i skipped the uh, season 12 set uh, still waiting for the re-release but yeah I'm, I'm over the moon to get this in the post not least of all because of the pack is so beautiful isn't it look check that out but yeah all those extras we've seen the list it looks like great stuff uh, i'll spare you the unboxing video because <laughs> i did that last time and let's be honest one is going to be much the same as another uh, but uh, yeah i hope you've got yours too and continue to uh, invest in these because even for those of us who are double or treble dipping i do believe that they're good value for money and there's lots of entertainment value and new content in there worth supporting underneath all that beautiful artwork while i remember yeah obviously season 26 1989 lots of guest stars in doctor who that year in particular it was the height of the time where they were being accused of stunt casting i suppose you could say uh, the epitome of which was uh, probably Nicholas Parsons, the late Nicholas Parsons, who, uh, who passed away yesterday. Now, I don't know how you guys feel about it. Some of you might have been there at the time and remember what had been going on in the few years before with Doctor Who, who they'd been casting in these guest star roles and the sort of attention it had been getting. Uh, through 1987, we'd got, <laughs> we'd got Ken Dodd, hadn't we? And in 1988, you know, they tried to get Prince Edward into the show for Silver Nemesis. That all sort of caved in. Uh, but we did get a couple of cameos in Silver Nemesis after all, which, you know, the less said about those, the better. But yeah, it was, there was this sort of whole wave of, of people from light entertainment going into Doctor Who and doing their little bit and piece and being, well, Ken Dodd, he was Ken Dodd, really, wasn't he? <laughs> there, was no, there was nothing better, nothing worse. And, um, you know, much of a muchness, really. Did exactly what you'd expect. But Nicholas Parsons came in, in Series 26, to play the Reverend Wainwright in The Curse of Fenric. And, uh, yeah, I think he, he did surprise everybody there's people out there i know watching this who don't really know who nicholas parsons was outside of that appearance in doctor who but to british tv viewers this guy was 
kind of royalty, certainly in the 60s, the 70s, and into the 80s, mostly for game shows, but lots of appearances on variety shows like the Kenny Everett Show, little sketch shows where he would invariably rip the you-know-what out of himself and his own public persona, if you like. He was that well-known. But he was doing the meta thing before I think we've, we'd even got a name for it. And after that, he went on to play the narrator in the Rocky Horror stage show. In fact, he could have been the original sort of big celebrity to um, subvert their own public image, really, and go and do that, you know, and to, uh, he was certainly the first narrator to, uh, to be, how can I put this, overtly himself and not so much sticking to the script, from what I've been led to believe. But yeah, Nicholas Parsons in Doctor Who. Do a search on YouTube, do a search on Google. You can find some of these other performances, seeing, do, doing the day job, doing the game show hosting. And uh, you see how much fun he was having, the way, the way he got with the British public. You know, it was, um, it was an easy charm. Some could, some would have him down as slimy, uh, but I never really saw it like that. And uh, yeah, the one thing I, I would recommend above all else, I've put this up, on social media already for the people who've never seen it is the comic strip presents film mr jolly lives lives next door that nicholas parsons was in with rick mail and aid edmondson he played himself opposite those two you know they were they were playing their usual kind of outrageous larger than life violent alcoholics uh, but yeah he went in playing himself uh, stephen frears directed that it's an incredible hours worth of entertainment and you know if you like the young ones all that sort of stuff bottom you get the general gist of it so i won't spoil it for you but it's one of the most quotable films look it's much much better with nail and i can't hold a candle to mr jolly lives next door and for everything that rick mail and aid edmondson do in that you know what you're gonna get lots of knees in their balls all that sort of stuff it wouldn't work anywhere near as well with our Nicholas Parsons. So do yourselves a favour. If you've not seen it or not seen it for a while, go and find that, buy it, rent it, or look for it on Vimeo, Vimeo, Vimeo or YouTube. Is that what they call it? Yeah, one of those places. And you'll find it. Yeah, good stuff. Rest in peace, Nicholas Parsons. We'll be talking about the Season 26 box set on the Type 40 podcast fairly soon. We've even got a guest lined up. Oh, it's a good one. It's a really good one. This this guy actually knows what he's talking about. So <laughs> Simon and I, we better uh, we better up our game considerably, I think, for that. So yeah, watch out for that. Oh, what else? What else? What else? Yeah, talking about Simon and the and the and the podcast, we have. We, I think we are getting ourselves together gradually. So there will be there will be one released about the fugitive of the Jadu. <laughs> We're not going to skip it. But we've got our Tesla episode coming out in the next day or two. It'll probably be out by the time you're seeing this. Who knows? Yeah, uh, it's the Type 40. Type 40 as a as a as a podcast and as these videos and all that sort of thing. I think people sometimes get a bit confused about where it all comes from and what's what's the space, but what's Type 40? But the general idea, you know, when I started doing these videos, which has been about six or seven months ago was pretty much me just dicking around. <laughs> uh, but people, people seem to like it and I really do enjoy doing it. And it kind of segues nicely into the things that we're doing on audio and on social media. But yeah, if you want to know where it all started, I've, I've got this, uh, I've got it here lined up. I'm still getting used to, still getting used to all this. But uh, this is the Type 40 Facebook group which we've had open for, well, this group's been in existence for longer than Type 40 has, really. It used to, used to go under a different name. Uh, but yeah, if you uh, look for us in the search field up there, Type 40 Adopted Facebook group, and you'll scroll down and see all these discussions on each episode as it goes out. We've got a uh, long-running discussion through there. It's not, not quite as long-running as usual, which is strange considering how much there was to talk about in that. But yeah, it's all going on there. New members arriving all the time. Yvette's just joined us. She looks like she's got a lot to say. She's dropping a couple of theories in there, a few pictures of uh, all the various things that have been going on. Yeah, but people do come in with their theories. That's why. That's one of the real reasons why I wanted to make this video, because people drop in with their theories. And I've never really been a huge one for theories, particularly since, particularly since the Stephen Moffat era, because whatever I would think of in my head, he'd come in with something considerably bigger 
didn't necessarily make a great deal more sense than what was in my head, but he would roll out something that was usually completely different, making me feel like I'd spent a few brain cells that, let's be honest, at my age, in my 40s, I don't think I can really afford to lose. So, yeah, Neil, Neil feels differently, though. He's getting stuck in there with his whole theory about the police box and whatnot. And yeah, sharing a clip of Dallas. I'm not sure why I find, <laughs> find out about that later, that later. But this is what I like about social media groups because you can have these sort of uh, deep dives and random quotes and shares and videos and whatnot. And yeah, come and find us. Come and have that chat that I keep talking about. I've got Vinay Patel there with his. Oh, that's, I don't know who that guy is. He's got a big gob. He's always on there. And yeah, yeah well, we've got a few friends. Glenn, who's been on the show, you know, he's got a, he's got his own podcast. And talk of that but again there's no somebody showing off about their box set again and the odd rare picture that one of us will find come and bring it and share it that is one that i found but uh that was on no, i was on twitter come to think of it it be coming and, and you can always see something in this group that you probably won't have seen before that's what i like about it because uh, people bring whatever they like and there's simon horton there yes simon who's been on some of these videos turns out you can go and meet simon if you're at the capital Doctor Who convention, that's run by the official Doctor Who Appreciation Society, no less. That's like somewhere in Gatwick in the middle of April. But yes, yeah, Simon's been roped in by another friend of the show, Neil Cole, who runs the Museum of uh, Science Fiction up north somewhere. They'll be manning the stand, meeting other fans, no doubt eating lots of hobnobs. Yeah, so if, you, if you've seen Simon on the show, go and tap him on the shoulder, give him a bit of a fright. <laughs> Tell him that I sent you. Yeah. Yes, that's, uh, that's, the, that's the general lay of the land there. Come and find the Type 40 Facebook group. You can always a few chats and a few shares. Um, yeah, there's all sorts of other things that I wanted to talk about too. Uh, but the, the, real, the real thing that's been in my head since, since Sunday has been all this new continuity. We, looks like we're going to be, looks like we're going to be getting, you know, there's no two ways about it. And this, new, old, forgotten, missing, alternative, parallel Doctor. Well, Chris Chibnall's come out and said that she's not from a parallel universe now. So any, any of us that were clinging on to that hope, uh, sadly, he's torpedoed it, hasn't he, Rosie? Yeah. yeah so, uh, but we, it looks like we've got to live with it for the time being. Yeah, so I do have a theory. There, there are people who are... Uh, seem to be sort of nailing it in that this new doctor could come somewhere between Patrick Troughton and John Pertwee. Not saying that, I, I think that's again wishful thinking that we can sort of ease that in there and that it won't disrupt the entire continuity of Doctor Who because let's be honest, that's what's going on here and this is what got under my skin because when would it have been? May, June, actually it was probably late June into July, so sometime in the summer. I heard some rumours. Rumours that at the time I thought were so outlandish, I kept to myself. I chuckled to myself and I kept them to myself. Now it turns out around the same time, other people were hearing exactly the same rumours. Simon, who I mentioned a minute ago for a start, he heard the same things. He kept it to himself too. And since we've had people making videos about them on, on YouTube, you know, it turns out they'd heard exactly the same rumours. And bit by bit by bit by bit, of course, as there, <laughs> as there comes the creeping realisation that these outlandish rumours, and, and, you know, destructive, it's, in my opinion, this, these are destructive things that are being done to the foundations, the very bedrock of Doctor Who. It's, uh, it's that simple. Now, when I heard the rumours, although I laughed them off, then when they resurfaced a few months later, I think it was on one of Gary Beekler's videos on Nerdrotic that I saw it first. And Bolstrek talked about it. Hi, guys. Um, yes, yeah, so obviously, when they started reporting about it, I did start to take it a little bit more seriously. Um, and that was when it really started to get under my skin. You know, if they do bring this to pass, how am I going to react? How am I going to feel? Because it is effectively uh, resetting, retooling the entire history of Doctor Who thrown in a completely different different slant and um would you call it I think you I do I think you call it a rewrite and um a, a prequel of sorts forms a sort of prequel continuity because that's the rumor isn't it that there's going to be this entire cycle of 
other regenerations that happen before the point where we meet the uh, meet the doctor and susan in that junkyard in 1963 totters lane and um yeah, the series itself has always shied away from going before that point. Andrew Cartwell did come close to sort of um, digging into the Doctor's past in season season 25 and season 26. But he and John Nathan Turner thought, thought better of it. But that was more connected to uh, the Time Lords themselves, wasn't it? It was um, that kind of more mythic. Whereas what they're doing here, it's the Doctor's own very, very personal and, and closer past um yes yeah, so i i even now I, I feel this is a negative thing that will impact on the series on the mythology negatively in general when all these uh, whoops and wows have have died down now out there in the general fandom the general fan base some people are very, very excited by this, but then they're the kind of people where, sorry, Ron. <laughs> they're the kind of people where, let's be honest, it never takes a great deal to get them to that place in any way over the tiniest thing. And um, I, I don't see a great swell of difference on one side or the other. The, the fandom seems just as divided over this as it has been over pretty much every decision that Chris Chibnall has made. Well, since that hoodie came down in that forest on Wimbledon final afternoon in 2017, it's been one. It's been one thing after another. Um, I don't think. Any, I don't think it's anything particularly profound. And I don't really think it's that clever. In fact, I think it's. Uh, if anything, it feels like low hanging fruit. Uh, but we'll be talking about that that in depth on the Type 40 podcast when because <laughs> the thoughts are still sort of cooking. I know how I, how I feel about it, but. Uh, yeah, I have a proper chat about that. But if people are people are wondering where it's all going to fit in, you know, regardless of of what we think about whether it's right or whether it's wrong, where is it going to fit in? Because you, you do want to make sense of this stuff, particularly if you've been living with the continuity for 50, 60 years. You know, it doesn't make us bad people if we've if we've held this stuff dear, does it? Um, because you know, this is what it is when you invest in a franchise, and the idea that you were uh, you are you are part of it and you contributed to it. I mean, Doctor Who fans, God, we kept the damn thing alive for crying out loud. And all we, all we really ask in return are a few good stories and just a little bit of respect, a little bit of a two-way street. Other shows can manage it. I can't see how, why uh, the makers of the Orville, <laughs> prime example, they can manage it. I don't see why the BBC can't. But yeah, people are wondering where it's all going to fit in. And all those, corner, all those cornerstones the new Doctor, the new TARDIS, all that sort of stuff, what that means. Well, I say new TARDIS, there was two, wasn't there? We saw two new TARDISes, TARDI, TARDISes, in Fugitive of the Jadoon. Uh, the, uh, the first one being this one. Uh, yeah, this, this belongs to Captain Jack Harkness, by the looks of things. If, he does, if it doesn't belong to him, he's certainly looking after it, so it's in his care. And uh, you've got the central console in the middle, and that... Uh, very very large floor space perfect for him to hold his kind of parties one would imagine uh, yeah but you probably say but dan they never said that was a tardis on screen did they no they didn't they didn't at all but it's certainly laid out like a tardis if you notice the hexagonal pattern on the floor and so it keeps a repeating pattern from several tardis sets well not just in the new series and the classic set uh, series as well um but it's that central console, isn't it? And the way that Jack's working it. But the, what really seals it for me is that uh, John Barrowman himself has said that it's a TARDIS. He made a video, which he streamed directly to social media uh, with his new white hair. He's, he's on uh, Dancing on Ice at the moment, isn't he? So he's got his, his natural white hair at the moment where he he says you know you saw me you you saw me in the tardis in this clip so it is a tardis whether they wanted him to say so or not he certainly sees it that way yes yeah, so that's our, our first one and um yeah it's it very much reminded me when i when i saw it first of a church organ if you if you know what i mean somebody would usually sit at a at a padded seat at the front when they banging away on the pipes and uh, sure enough, somebody's done a bit of detective work. I think this was over on Twitter. And they found out 
because I did wonder that's that's one hell of a big set, isn't it? Where could it possibly have been filmed? And yeah, it turns out that it is indeed it is indeed somewhere uh, church-like. It's at uh, Clifton Cathedral in Bristol. There we can see it's unmistakably the same place with that hexagonal floor and that distinctive wall there. The, the tiles. If you look at the inset, there's some carved pictures of uh, biblical scenes no doubt biblical characters so yeah they've gone pretty big oh and just to the <laughs> just i don't know, just, know that just to the right there we have the organ and the pipes and things so yeah that's that mistress of yeah tardis number one uh but of course uh, tardis number two belongs to this lady yeah that's uh that's the doctor gonna take a little bit of a little bit of getting used to this idea of yet another new old doctor. Um, the actress, Jo Martin. I'll say now that uh, I knew her face when I saw her in publicity pictures for the role of, uh, of Ruth. Uh, but I couldn't, I couldn't tell you what I'd seen her in, you know, hand on my heart. And to be fair, you know, generally with Doctor Who, that's not, that's not a bad thing at all. You, despite the fact this is a big role, Doctor Who is a star-making series. The Doctor is a star-making role. We don't know where this is going yet. My guess is that this is Chibnall's River Song. This is Chibnall's Captain Jack. This is the re recurring character of the Jodie Whittaker era. Because I, I don't think that Chris Chibnall will be around any longer than Jody Whittaker. I don't think he'll, we'll ever see him cast another full-time Doctor. But more to the point, I think that uh, that Joe's character, Joe Martin's character, is the uh, is the timeless child, all grown up. I think that's where we're going. That's where we're going back in time with this. Uh, yeah, but the in the Tardis there, looking minty fresh and spectacular. But to me, this is the clue of where, of where this character really comes from and why it's, uh, despite, despite her clothes, I'd say, you know, it's quite Capaldi-esque, isn't it? Certainly at the bottom and at the top, even though it's got that, it's got the, got the frock coat vibe, you, uh, that, that's more now, isn't it? That's the kind of clothing you would buy at, in some sort of specialist shop and you know, some outfitters that a cosplayer or a LARPer would go to or somebody from the sea or not now, i know somebody who dresses like that quite a lot but not with, without the shirt i think she looks stunning in that i think she um it really does suit her and it is doctorish you know there's my <laughs> as opposed to uh somebody else's costume but you know we'll come to that another time yeah the, t the tardis unmistakably the tardis the uh the roundled walls which you know as a child of the late 70s and the 80s you know they it does it gives it gives me the warm fuzzies just looking at that at that of course it does but to me this all clinches this all clinches the deal when we get inside and we see that console room the look of surprise there on the 13th doctor's face when she realizes somebody's just stolen her thunder and her series from under her. and yeah all the paneling around it and all that sort of thing the uh centerpiece in the ceiling it all looks so connected and even though that though that's still 1960s technology there with the dials and the readouts and the switches and the uh the washing up the washing machine sorry parts spinning around in the middle it all looks like it could belong you know it doesn't seem particularly outrageous uh, but yet yeah, this is what convinces me that it's definitely they're definitely going pre hartnell with this they're definitely reinventing the series mythology taking all that and sort of placing it much much later on uh, because when you look look around the set from from ceiling to floor a lot of the things are familiar if not from the Hartnell era itself then from things that we've seen since we've got the, the grating there on the floor which is obviously the very uh, Christopher Eccleston and David Tennant from a start the way that it's lit, that bluer hue, is uh, the Peter Capaldi tile. It's very, very much blue. But yeah, yeah. What um, what really clinches it for me in the in the uh, in the notion that this is the original Tardis, that this is set way before Unearth the Child, is uh, 
is this. I think this is what they're doing. I think that version of the console room, we can look to this for clues about what they're doing. There's the console room that the, the war doctor was using in the uh, day of the doctor. So well, what's, always, what's always appealed to me about this design, what I've always thought was so clever, is that it looks, it's basically the same set as that we first meet the ninth doctor in, isn't it? You know, we've got, we've got two steps up to the, it's the same console for a star, just a little cleaner. And we've got the two steps raising up, but the, the silver panels on the top of the war doctor's titles have been taken away. And the idea, you know, that would be the mesh underneath that we see in the Christopher Eccles store. So it's the same room just after it's like not been looked after so much. Maybe it's been through, well, it's been through the time war for a start. It's been through all that. And, and whatever, I mean, when we know that the, the John Hurt Doctor, you know, he proper explodes, so maybe that took it all out. Maybe that's what the extra scorching is. But that, that's, this is it. And I think they're, they're doing exactly the same in offering us this TARDIS. I think this, with all the extra scenery around it, which a lot of it is repurposed from other productions. I'm, I'm sure some of you have noticed which bits they've, they've taken from an adventure in space and time and other, and, uh, other productions. It's, it's, all, it's basically the same set and the same general layout, just with extra cladding, would you say? Home comforts. Because when you, uh, and I do think that's a spectacular view, apart from the fact that the central console is slightly skew -whiffed. So yeah, I don't, uh, somebody wasn't, wasn't watching the marks there. Yeah, so um, if you look at it, compared to that, we've got the, the same, pretty much the same piece in the floor, haven't we? So there's all that synergy with the, uh, the TARDIS from that was from, Hellbent, wasn't it? Yeah. So this is the this is the um, the reinvented original TARDIS for the for the modern show, and and for HD crucially, where the idea is obviously we can see a few more details. So yeah, this sits very nicely with what we've established. Tardises actually look like so. What I what I am offering here is my theory as conclusive proof is that, uh, that when we meet the Hartnell Doctor in an unearthly child, the same thing has sort of happened. There's been some sort of accident, some sort of, some sort of crash whereby he's lost, he's lost his memory of, of this life, where he, he looks like Ruth the tour guide, and, um, and whoever else may come afterwards. And yeah, the, the TARDIS itself took a bit of a battering and all those extra pieces from around the ceiling, they would have got blown up or, or taken away or collapsed or whatever. Same with the floor, those lights just blew out. And grated, same, same again. And uh, yeah, we're going we're gonna to be left with the idea that the, uh, the TARDIS that's, that he steals from Gallifrey when it's in the shop it was there for repairs that maybe you know were a result of whatever calamity befell this one and the uh, the mystery doctor. I suppose we'll find out. But yeah, that's my theory. For me, this places all of this before Hartnell. This means that Hartnell's doctor isn't the first doctor anymore, which I think personally is um, disrespectful to the everybody really who put the series together originally i don't i don't see how, how it's necessary uh, but nevertheless they have done it so that's to be continued if you want some more of my opinions on that the ones that are still cooking why i believe the way the things i do because i'm sure that not everybody will be on board with the things i'm saying and that's absolutely fine let me know in the comments you can like and subscribe and share and do whatever call me names if you like but yeah that's how I see it. But I thought we'd finish off there with a, a nice picture of the original Hartnell, Hartnell TARDIS. Cozy TARDIS in the, in the studio there at Lime Grove with those stenciled numbers along the top. Just to put it all into perspective. It is all, all make-believe, I know, but is it bad that we care so much? I don't think it is. I'm not going to apologise for caring. Not 
a bit, not with the amount of money that I've spent anyway. <laughs> yeah, what else, what else? Before you go, yeah. I did manage to uh, get a look at Jo Martin on Twitter. She's got a Twitter account. And uh, she just seemed like a really nice woman. She's done a lot of good work and seems over the moon to be in Doctor Who. And I, you know, who would begrudge her that? You can hear more of my views and Simon's and Starry Eyed Girls on the next or next after edition of the Type 40 podcast from the Fandom Podcast Network. I'll be sharing the links to that another time. In the meantime, I've also, after saying I would, I know, Rosie, I, I told her I would never do this. I, I joined Twitter a few months ago, around September, October time. And, uh, you know, I, I found it quite difficult to, difficult to uh, navigate, to get around on there. So don't know how it all works. So sometimes people reply to things that I've said or they retweet me. I don't know where it's going. Sometimes it's from something I tweeted a few days before, in which case I've forgotten all about it because I'm gay. Yeah, 46. Yeah, so uh, I'll get there in the end, let's put it that way. But generally, most of the contact that I've had on Twitter, despite all the warnings that I heard, has been really, really nice. I've met some great people, seen some things that I probably would never have seen otherwise, images and things, opinions from all sides, but generally it wasn't, it wasn't too bad until Doctor Who came back. And it's been quite an education ever since. But... I'm not going to name any names. It takes all sorts to make a world. If you want to uh, find me over on over on Twitter, I'll get this up for you. You can come and you can come and search for me there. Uh, there's my Twitter profile. You can look for me. I'm, I'm as the Space Book Dan Hadley, Birmingham's King of the Geeks, as, I, as I'm fond of saying. Come and find me. Uh, follow chip in send me something tweet me something that's it and uh you know interact a little if you've enjoyed this video and you want to see some more as i said like subscribe ring the little bell wherever that is be my guest and there'll be more videos soon i would imagine I'm certainly going to get simon back we've got lots of things to talk about particularly with a new blu-ray set that we're both going to be we're working our way through we can't wait to get cracking on that more comments we've had some comments in we'd like some more questions for myself questions for rosie questions for simon and questions for that starry eyed girl sarah graham you can uh, you can leave those below in the comments box or you can tweet me you can join the facebook group or whatever we'd love to see you there thank you for your time this afternoon i'm gonna stop rambling now i think that's been pretty much everything you've probably had enough of me already She's enough of me. Let's go and have something to eat. Bye-bye. <laughs>